Okay, we're gonna start with topic number one, which is the movement of the electrons. Okay, so we're gonna start with ionic compounds. Okay, ionic compounds are where our electrons are transferred. Okay, an ionic compound is made of cations that are positive and anions that are neg negative. And they're gonna attract one another just like magnets. Remember when we did the magnet lab, we noticed that opposites are going to attract one another, okay? And so our positive cations are gonna be attracted to our negative anions, and they're gonna to stick to each other kind of like a magnet does. And these cations and anions are gonna combine in such a way that their charge equals zero. So I can have a one plus with a one minus, that's a nice, easy one-to-one -one ratio. I can have a two plus charge with a one minus, but I'm gonna need every, for every two plus, I'm gonna need two of the one minuses. So that's gonna end up forming compounds in a one to two ratio, one cation for every two anions. And so it's going to have a very different structure when it's done, simply because the ratio is different. Still on ionic compounds. Most ionic compounds are crystalline solids. So they will form crystal networks. A crystal is a three-dimensional network of positive and negative ions. This is a beautiful example right here of sodium chloride. Okay, it makes a beautiful one-to-one -one ratio crystal. So it's a nice cubic crystal. And if you notice, it looks like this. Um, you probably only recognize um, sodium chloride as table salt, so you've probably only ever seen it in really tiny, tiny little um, crystals that have been kind of broken apart into little pieces. If you were to dissolve that in water and let it evaporate naturally, you'd get these beautiful um, cubic sort of crystals as it evaporates. So if you'll notice in the picture here, we start with a neutral sodium and a neutral chlorine. My neutral sodium is going to give an electron to the chlorine. The sodium becomes one plus and the chlorine becomes one minus. And remember that's because of the difference between the protons and the electrons. We've got 11 positive protons here and only 10 electrons. So this becomes one plus. We've got 17 positive protons here and then 18 electrons because we added one. So now this is one minus because we have more electrons. And they are gonna arrange themselves into this beautiful crystal lattice structure. Over to covalent bonds, still on topic one. So topic one for covalent bonds, this is through the sharing of electron pairs. Electrons always come in pairs when we do this kind of bonding because they are in an orbital together. Remember that our S and P orbitals are where we do bonding, okay? And there's one S orbital, three P orbitals. And so our covalent bonds are going to happen in the S and P orbitals of our outer energy level, okay? If we have unequal sharing of electrons, so one of our atoms has a higher electronegativity than the other, we're going to have a polar covalent bond. If we have equal sharing of electrons because we have a fairly equal electronegativity value between our two atoms, that's going to result in a nonpolar um, compound. So unequal is polar, equal is nonpolar. All right, let's watch this quick little video. It's gonna show you how that bonding works. Many atoms form covalent bonds. In covalent bonds, electrons are shared by both atoms. The first energy level in atoms can hold two electrons. By sharing electrons in a covalent bond, each hydrogen atom has a full outermost energy level. Water molecules are also held together with covalent bonds. Again, we see that covalent bonding gives each atom a full outermost energy level. The outermost energy level for hydrogen can hold two electrons. The outermost energy level for the oxygen can hold eight electrons. In covalent bonds, the shared electrons move between the atoms that share them, forming a single electron cloud around both atoms. Okay, so just a reminder, hydrogen and helium are the exception to the octet rule, and everybody needs eight valence electrons in order to lower their potential energy, except for hydrogen and helium. They only have the S orbital because they're at the first energy level and the first energy level only has the S orbital. So you'll notice in this water molecule, we only needed two electrons to make our hydrogen stable and we needed eight for the oxygen. 
But really the idea here is that our electron clouds are overlapping one another. So we have an overlap in the electron clouds so that we can share those electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Okay, so we're still on topic one, but let's talk about metallic bonding. Metallic bonding is extremely different from ionic or covalent bonding, and it has to do with how metals are structured. Metals have what we call a highly mobile set of valence electrons, okay? Highly mobile means they can move. They can move anywhere. They roam freely throughout the atom. We call them being delocalized. They don't actually have to stick with the atom to whom they belong. They can move anywhere throughout the entire sample of metal, okay? We call that the sea of electrons. It is constantly moving. All of the electrons from all of the atoms are just constantly moving throughout the entire metal sample. They do not stay with a single atom. That's very different to ionic or covalent bonding. And the reason that we have this ability with metallic bonding is largely because we have a lot of um, fairly empty d orbitals that we can have transfer of all of these valence electrons through all these empty orbitals that are kind of on top of each other and overlapping. And so it creates, <clears throat> excuse me, what I like to call the electron superhighway. The electrons are able to just travel anywhere they want because they've got overlapping orbitals everywhere. And so they can go just anywhere throughout the metal that they want. All right, let's move to topic number two, the types of elements that are involved in each type of bond. I would assume at this point that, that we already probably know most of this, but let's go ahead and make sure we have it written down real good. Ionic bonds form between metals and nonmetals, and that's because metals have a very few valence electrons, nonmetals have quite a lot. And so our metal will transfer and lose electrons to the nonmetal. The nonmetal will then gain the electrons from the metal. It's a nice little even trade. I need to get rid of my electrons to lower my energy level. I need to gain electrons in order to fill my energy level. Everybody's good, okay? Covalent bonds, so still topic two, move over to covalent bonds. <clears throat> Again, this occurs between nonmetals and nonmetals, and the reason for that is they're both very high in valence electrons, so they both have very high electronegativity values and ionization energies. Okay? They're not willing to just give up an electron. It doesn't happen because their electronegativity values are too high and their ionization energies are too high. The other element does not have a high enough electronegativity to combat the ionization energy of the other atom. So we got to share. We got to share. Okay? So for example, nitrogen and phosphorus, we have an electronegativity value of 3.0 and 2.1, which results in 0.9. If you look at the 0.9, that falls in this range, making that polar covalent. Iodine and selenium, so this is one where our electronegativity values are really close. Iodine is 2.5, selenium 2.4. So this is one instance where we would have two atoms of different type that do actually end up being nonpolar because the difference between them is so small. That 0.1 is between the 0 0.0 and the 0 0.3 over here in the nonpolar covalent region. Okay, and this is just a different way of looking at it. Um, I think this is a really great visual. Nonpolar covalent, notice how this is nice and evenly spread. Our electron cloud is nice and even between our two atoms nuclei, okay? In a polar covalent bond, over here, there's a disproportionate spread, okay? We have more electrons hanging out over here because this atom has a higher electronegativity than this one. You'll notice, look at this little symbol. This little symbol is um, a Greek letter and it means we have a slightly negative charge over here and a slightly positive charge. Not like ionic bonds where you have a full one negative, one plus, but because we have extra electrons hanging out over here, this side has sort of a slightly negative region Whereas this side is lacking the electrons that it's sharing because its electrons are spending more time with this atom. And so it has a slightly positive charge because its nucleus is more exposed. 
So, still on topic two, let's go over to metallic bonds. They form between metals. So this is if you have two atoms from the left side of the periodic table. Let's move on to topic number three, the strength of the bonds. This is super important. We will ask a lot of questions about who's gonna have the stronger bond. So let's start with ionic bonds. Super strong, super strong. And if you think about it, that makes sense. We have a giant crystal full of tons of attractions. And so they are actually a very strong bond. And if you think about it, you know that already because you have never in your life melted table salt. Can't be done. Well, it can be, but it has to be at extremely high temperatures that you could never achieve in your kitchen, okay? We measure the strength of the bond in terms of lattice energy. So the crystal lattice is what we call that giant crystal that it forms. So the lattice energy is the, requ the energy required to separate the cations and anions in the crystal. And you can imagine that since there's so many different attractions there, it takes an enormous amount of energy to separate everybody, okay? The higher the lattice energy, the stronger the ionic bond was. So sometimes you have really, really strong bonds, sometimes you have less strong bonds. This is gonna also affect whether or not it will dissolve in water. Some ionic compounds do, some do not, and it has to do with how strong their lattice energy is. If the lattice energy is stronger than the attraction to the water, it will not dissolve. If it is weaker than the attraction to the water, it will. Let's go over to covalent bonds. Still on topic three. Not as strong, and this should make sense. Covalent bonds exist as these individual molecules. They don't form that giant crystal. So really we're only talking about the attraction between just the atoms in this one molecule, okay? So covalent bonds are not nearly as strong. We measure the strength of the bond by what's called bond energy, and that is the energy required to separate the bonded atoms, which can be done, absolutely. We do it all the time with chemical reactions. We'll separate a bond, um, but we have to supply enough energy to break the bond in order for that to happen. So this is still under covalent bonds. We have several different types of bonds. We have long bonds that are weak and then we have shorter bonds that are strong. Long bonds are much easier to break because they have a much lower bond energy, okay? So if we have two atoms that have a short radius, it's going to be much stronger bond, okay? Versus these much longer bonds. Okay, those are easier to break apart. Let's go over to metallic bonds. They vary greatly in strength. It really depends on what atoms you have involved, <laughs> okay? And we measure this by the heat of vaporization. In other words, we measure their, the strength of a metallic bond by how much energy we need in order to go to the gas phase with a metal. And if you think about what you know about metals, getting them to the gas phase, vaporizing a car, takes a lot of energy. So they have decently strong energy. The higher the heat of vaporization, the stronger the metallic bond was. All right, let's move to topic four, properties of the compounds. For ionic compounds, they are very strong forces holding them together. So they're gonna have super high melting points. They're gonna have super high boiling points. They are going to be very poor conductors as a solid because the electrons cannot move. So they will not conduct electricity as a solid. But as a liquid, they will. So if we can get them to the liquid phase, which would require an enormous amount of energy, they will have free electrons that are able to move. They are also going to be extremely hard and extremely brittle. Covalent molecules are not very strongly held together. So they are going to have lower melting points, lower boiling points. They are very poor conductors as solids and liquids. So ionics could be conductors as liquids. These ones cannot, they do not conduct. And they are not as hard as ionic compounds, but they are also extremely brittle. Not as brittle as an ionic compound, but still pretty brittle. The forces holding metallic bonds together can vary greatly depending on the nuclei and the C of electron. So they have a wide range of melting points. They have a wide range of boiling points, but because their electrons can easily move, they are incredibly good conductors. All we need is to be able to move electrons and we can conduct electricity and heat. So they are very good conductors because their electrons are freely moving. They can be either soft or hard. Some metals are soft enough that you can cut them like a stick of butter. Some of them are hard and you are going to be able to build buildings out of them. 
They're malleable. If I hit it with a hammer, I can flatten it out into a sheet. They're ductile. I can draw them out into a wire. And they have luster. They're shiny. Luster means that they shine. Okay, and they are shiny because of those easily moving electrons. They are able to absorb and then re-emit light very easily. So we're gonna cut this here for today. And then next week we'll pick up with special topic five on a different page.